maneuver. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to a little thing I'm calling Three Up, Three Down, where I try to trick Andrew Holder into being interested in universes again by using baseball terminology. Uh, it's a pretty simple video. I'm just going to talk about three things that I think went up with Attack on Titan, three things I liked, and then, of course, three things I don't like because negativity is good for views. And so I figured I'd keep it an even split down the middle here. And, you know, you can't uh, point out... The negatives without acknowledging the positives right so first up we have big poke attacks uh i like thick attacks and i cannot lie it offers a new risk reward dynamic uh you know getting to play these high difficulty cards getting a huge payoff for them you know you're investing hopefully at least some foundations into them or the deck building cost of playing cards like deadly research playing mostly six checks, um, things we've seen in the past to compensate for this high difficulty is definitely a new world of deck building. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of these blank attacks that are just, I think they're statted like eight for 10 or eight for 11 or 11 for eight, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. I wouldn't be surprised if those actually find homes just because this is a style of play that people aren't really adapting to really well or at least they don't enjoy adapting to it so um that new risk reward dynamic is kind of cool to see uh it carries the stat load for some characters there's definitely some characters in attack on time that don't have like the most impressive stats almost every character is uh speed or damage can't think of any that don't off the top of my head even um ange zoe you know gives plus two speed when you play the deck correctly so having these uh, high stats initially, I think actually helps a lot of older characters out. I've definitely belly ached about how if your character isn't providing stats to attacks, they're probably not a viable character in most formats. And I think this might solve that issue for them, you know, resolve a couple really big important attacks and plus two speed might not be the biggest deal breaker. Um, it also pairs well with the Godzilla themes. So you always like to see older cards supported. You know, the, the Godzilla themes of play a five or higher difficulty attack or have them in your discard pile, things like that. Uh, it's always nice to see two products that come out relatively close together uh, share some dynamics, right? So that's very, very cool. Um, another up is the world building. Sacrifice, desperation, Heavy consequences, hopelessness, determination, commitment are all themes that represent the manga and the set itself. Um, I, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, the flavor text convinced me to start reading the manga. I've been reading it a little bit, a few chapters before bed every night. And uh, I've, I've been really surprised, honestly, about how well the themes from at least the first, you know, third or so of the manga where these cards are mostly taking place, um, they really do fit. Like they really do create this board state, this kind of environment, uh, especially in the spotlight format where the, it, it, it takes a few pivotal moments to really decide things. Um, Attack on Titan is kind of a, a horror element to it a lot of the time. It's actually pretty frustrating reading the manga where these huge giant monsters just come out of nowhere, right? It's just the nature of not having an animated real-time medium. So I might check out the anime. Maybe it gives a little more brevity to the situations. But, you know, a lot of times these characters just get snatched up and it's over. It's over for them. If you get grabbed by a Titan, it's over. You are too weak. You know, you are not strong enough to get out of its grip. They are uh, voracious monsters that are just trying to eat you. And so uh, a lot of the early themes are about how humans can't hope to win against Titans. And um, sacrificing yourself for humanity is all the Survey Corps is really known for. You know, they're not known for winning against the Titans. They're known for suffering heavy casualties. You know, the heavy consequences of of just getting any amount of research into understanding these monsters so they can better fight them in the future, uh, you know, is a huge theme. So the determination and commitment to overcome the obvious obstacles in your way are represented, I think, a lot with the 
the way that you are committing a lot of foundations or you're committing to these high difficulty attacks because if you want to deal these high health totals um i'll talk a little bit more about this later but if you want to fight against backups you know dealing a lot of damage all at once is a big deal and that kind of fits the world building um the titans they have a weak spot right but they you have to deliver an attack with a specially made sword and you have to be trained and really strong and they always have to spin around like a million times you know you can't just like there's actually a point um there's a card i think that has the art with flavor text where uh sasha is like trying to use like a normal axe to to fight the smallest like human sized titan almost like it's slightly taller than her and She's like, I, you know, I, I can't fight it if my blade can't cut through its skin and, and kill it in one shot. So their regenerative powers, right, are like this big deal. So the commitment and determination have to strike true and fast. All this stuff, I don't know, it works out. The massive monsters should have massive attacks. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, oh, and I talked about one-shine backups, you know, is very important. So, you know, taking out a Titan in one strike, right, making it a, a small fast uh engagement is really really important so i thought all this stuff really came together really well you can't see i didn't plan this out very well but uh the the flavor text that convinced me to read the manga was um shocking revelation krista who's a character in the set krista lens says my name is historia and i was like that's got to be important it's not <laughs> Not talked about a whole lot in any of the other cards you know i couldn't find like an obvious story thread through the rest of the cards um i had kind of an idea because you know the show's been around for a while and i've definitely asked people a lot about the story to have some understanding but this is the card where i was like you know what i should just read it i should just find out for myself and i have been pleasantly surprised both with like sort of the striking manga style um the art itself almost made it onto here as an up i'll be honest just because I do think they did really good with what they were provided. Um, but that doesn't sound like an up. That sounds like a backhanded compliment, so I didn't want to include it. But, you know, it, it's stuff like this with the flavor text that got me to go, let me just find out for myself. And I've been having a blast with it. So up, world building is an up for me, you know. Um, we'll talk more about that later, though. Uh, up is double face cards for sure. Uh, transforming cards are a slam dunk in basically every game. There's definitely people who have issues with them. I think the only real issue I can find with it off the top of my head is limited environments where you're trying to take a card directly out of a pack, put it in a deck and play it. Um, checkmark cards are there for that. There are solutions to this. It's not the end of the world. Uh, werewolves are cool in <laughs> magic. People like transforming their leader in Dragon Ball Super um you know i've liked it in like every game i've played we used to have like the character stacking thing for it and so as far as character cards go it's not the biggest deal right there's lots of ways to utilize double face cards not just characters and shift attacks there's definitely lots of cool things you can do um transforming lands are a really popular thing in magic right where you've got like a basic land or maybe now they're different card types uh, they have like creatures that when they die they transform and they come back as a land and we've got Phyrexian Praetors that transform into a saga, a story, and then they come back as, they do all kinds of stuff. So like there's so many things you can do with it, um, it it's just, I don't know, it's a way to get more, <laughs> more value into a card, like there's so many things you can do. I'm excited whenever they bring something new to universes. There's no reason why a game should be around for 20 years and not be able to at least explore different avenues of ways to bring you the cards and different ways to put the game information on there. So I think double face cards are just kind of an obvious slam dunk and any any issues with them has been solved. If we're not implementing those solutions, maybe that's something we got to do in the future. But I like transforming cards. I like double face cards. I'm here for it. So we got our downs. We have our three ups. So we got to go into our downs. Down, we got Birdhold back here. Uh, it's the health based power creep. I didn't want to believe it at first. And health is, it's it's one of the more boring ways to make a character more viable. It's not usually the end of the world, um, especially depending on the the power level of 
attacks that you have and like you know synergies and things like that we've definitely had formats in the past free mha boom where 35 health just wasn't a big deal it was more about what's in your stage than your health total and in that respect that's one of the only times where we felt like we had a more traditional card game style of the last hit point is the only one that matters um back when you could just get 100 to zeroed from the most random stuff like truly any ultra rare in libra of souls could combine with like one or two other cards to just put you in a game winning situation right like if you left unchecked scarlet meteor was gonna win you the game like half the time just by resolving it so health isn't the most end all be all power creep but it is one of the most boring ways um, increased health totals mean longer games and casual settings I find whenever I'm just trying to jam like a goofy ha ha deck that's probably not going to have the cleanest attack lines and you know not going to have armor of the wolf or walk the dog in it uh, dealing 35 health sounds like I'm going to be there for an hour like truly if I'm playing four damage moves even if I play six of them in a turn and you block two of them uh, I did less than half your health, and I'll have to do that like two more times as the game goes on, probably. So, it, you know, it, it's just an increase to the game length. Um, and it's difficult to come back from that power creep. Um, making stronger attacks doesn't necessarily mean that you want to play lower health characters. Uh, making lower health characters deal more damage is not going to make you want to play lower health characters half the time you know you, you you get into like sort of this arms race kind of a thing where um you'll have to design just specifically away from it and probably wait for rotation or introduce mechanics that don't work with these characters right if you want to go back to a world where 630 629 is the normal then you know, if these characters are going to be pit next to each other, they'll have to be doing something so much more favorable than an entire attack's worth of health. I just think it's going to be difficult to come back from the over 30 health character design. Uh, down set size, lots of frustration with collecting this set. Uh, many cards that don't seem like they add anything, even in a limited environment. It's just hard to tell. It's hard to tell that impact. Uh, the blink attacks in limited makes sense to me. You know, the big ones, I guess I should say. I don't think there's any low difficulty blank attacks. There might be. I don't know. But just having like a strictly feels bad card, even in your limited pool, did such a weird thing. Um, and I think the biggest thing is there's lots of missed opportunities in storytelling. Uh, I said that I started reading the manga because of the flavor text right and i've recognized so many scenes it's been so cool there's so much of the manga in the set which is awesome uh but i felt let down when i got to this scene for a titanic leap um it's a pivotal moment in the manga i don't want to do a bunch of spoilers but it's also like a super old series so like i don't feel too bad but like this is one of the moments where they fight a titan with intelligence where they start to realize like, oh, this one's not just abnormal, but it's smart, it's learning, it knows its weakness. If you can see, it's hard to tell in the art, you know, just because we're getting a still image and you wouldn't know what to look for, but it's covering its neck, right? And that's Annie, that's a female Titan. She's covering her neck because that's her weak spot and she knows it. And um, in this particular scene, She's not jumping on them. I thought she was like jumping up in the air and they were like trying to catch on to her as she's leaving or something. But what's happened is they're like hooking into her so they can use their maneuvering gear and to catch up to her to attack her. And she's jumping in the air and you can see she's grabbed one of their lines and they don't know how to fight that. They don't know how to fight a Titan that's manipulating their vertical maneuvering gear. It's never happened before. Uh, as you can imagine, it causes heavy casualties for the Survey Corps. And so that just seemed like such a big moment and such like a cool action sequence and like a big reveal where they're like, oh my God, what do we do? All of a sudden the Titan is grabbing onto 
you know these hooks that were that we've always just latched into the titan and they're using our own weapons against us and this card doesn't portray any of that it doesn't tell me what's happening even with the art itself right um it it with the name and its blankness, uh, I thought she was jumping up and like sitting on them. Like genuinely, I thought this was like a Mount Lady tribute where she was just kind of flopping down on them because she's a big ass Titan. Um, and that's not what's happening at all. So the other one I think is called Attack the Walls. It's where the colossal Titan has like his rib gauge stuck into the wall and he's swinging at all of them and it's, Maybe the most iconic scene from the anime. It's one of the only scenes in the anime I've, you know, I remember seeing like posted everywhere and I had no idea what's going on still because I hadn't followed the anime either. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, it's such an involved scene to just be like, it's a seven speed for 11 damage. That's it. It's just, it's the attack Titan. And I thought he was like half defeated. I thought in the art, he's like, his rib cage is like holding on to the wall and like his lower half is gone. And I thought it was like a desperate attack after he had started to climb the wall and they like cut him in. Like, no, none of that. It's it's none of that at all. It's not, I don't know if you could explain that one in, <laughs> with card dexter abilities. I, there's a, and with 300 cards, you know, designing unique abilities for them is nearly impossible. It's such a ridiculous task. You gotta have vanillas, but like, there's so many cool card arts from awesome moments that I feel kind of let down that they're just blank commons now. Um, it's, I don't know, it's really kind of depressing. Um, we, we still have cards that are just people yelling at each other. We have staring at people as a seven difficulty attack or six difficulty attack uh there's yamir's face is just like selfish strike it just there's so many i don't know like important moments in the manga that are just tacked on to blank cards and it feels weird it feels like for all the good we did with the storytelling there's so many things that just got missed um the next down is the character design uh, transforming characters carry these character designs really hard. Um, they do so little and they do so much similar to each other. Uh, unless, except, you know, except like one is the sacrifice for speed. The other is the sacrifice for damage character, right? One is the sacrifice for damage, but they can transform and do a million other things and the other guy doesn't, you know? Uh, most characters are existing card designs with very mild differences all the way down to one of the characters in the set having the same design as an asset that you can tutor with another card from the set on his symbols. Um, redundancy is good, but that's a bit much for me. He, the, the, you know, Mikasa just being seven hand size Reese with no keyword gate is weird i mean i'm i'm trying not to get too down on the character designs because i do feel like that's probably the place where people put a magnifying glass the most and it's so difficult with how many characters that have existed this is a card that starts in play so the abilities have to be balanced the abilities have to be you know fun and interesting but most importantly fair and so you know, especially if you're trying to have like a simple set with simple characters, I really get it. But it's it's so tough to look at how many of these characters and it's like not only are they similar to each other, but they're similar to old designs that just have one or two very, very minor differences between them. It's hard to get excited by reading the text on the characters. Um, and then I think the biggest issue for me is every character has the same transformational requirement except Aaron Yeager, the Promising Scout. Um, he has, if you have eight or more face down foundations, you transform Aaron Yeager, Promising Scout. So he's like the only guy who can necessarily control his transformation. Um, but that also makes him really weak to ruin. So it seemed like a weird decision in general for Aaron Yeager to be trying to generate face downs in the ruin set, but. Overall, uh, it, 
you know, it seems like there's very much like certain characters that are built for constructed. Most of the characters are built for the limited experience. And if four or five characters make it into the constructed standard metagame, that's almost certainly going to be a success from a design standpoint. So I think they've like hit that mark. It's just these characters, if they didn't transform, you know, even if you buffed their front side so that they're just better, they would not be very interesting. None of them really do like their own mini game. They just kind of do whatever they're doing really good. Um, Annie's probably the most outstandingly different one. And then Krista is very different because she gets to stack decks. She gets to stack both players decks. So those are like kind of the outliers there. Um, but Big Mouth Titan is just like another six hander that gets a free momentum, you know, and he's got like <laughs> a recursion effect on his face. Bert Holt transforms and he does like a huge, big thematic burn and ruin combo. And that's very cool. Um, but then he's Mount Lady stun one and three damage. You know, he, he stuns face downs, which is, you know, strictly worse, but he ruins a bunch. So they shouldn't be face down anyways, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's my biggest down with the set probably is I think once we've moved past this format specifically and we have not only something just new, um, but something that is competitively viable from a new product that competes with these characters, I don't think too many people are going to come back because there's interesting interactions here. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. I could very, very well be wrong in the next set. Next major set is another Attack on Titan set, so it would stand to reason that, you know, these characters will get some extra support, but it's just very weird to feel like, you know, the Aaron Yeager Attack Titan character, I think he's, what, mill two, and you get two damage for each attack, and then if a player has nine or more, you transform him, and, like, once per turn, if an attack is not blocked, your rival flips one is so rough you know what i mean like that's just so so rough um and then once you transform you're just a stat stick you just uh tra you, you well you get four damage and you remove cards from your discard pile which isn't even a cost so like people pointed out that uh, i think that's actually a good thing i think the synergy with removing cards <laughs> means it shouldn't be a cost but you know that's one of the more interesting characters and it's I don't know. He has to work really hard to get to a stat level that Endeavor doesn't. You know? um, the transformation on Aaron attack time is cool. You get to go get an attack similar to Endeavor, right? So I don't know. It it was the biggest miss for me, but I do have a surprise for you guys. There's a little deception in this video. I have a bonus up because I always like to end on a positive note, an optimistic note, and this means that this is an objectively positive video for all you negative Nancys out there. Um, my bonus up is event-based scaling, and the way that I define that is, um, it includes pretty much any when you do X, perform Y, or for every time you have done X, perform Y abilities. Uh, these just bring a natural dopamine rush, even if you don't win the game, Everyone, everyone I've met for the most part likes to, you know, tick their little die up for every time that they've done something and you get to keep track of stuff. Uh, we've seen it in the past a lot with like counting your card pool if you're Jiro or playing Falling Skies, um, charge attacks for home run comment or charge and printed high, I guess. So like we've had little stuff like that with the card pool itself. Uh, people love playing Ymir. Ymir counts every time you've gained life. So for every time you've gained life, you get bonus damage. Um, just very cool stuff like that. That's something that I don't think we've seen a lot in universes. And I think it's because they're worried about keeping track of the game information. You know, keeping track of every little thing is already difficult to a lot of people. But these are the fun ones. These are the good ones. These are the cool ones. These are the ones that people want to keep track of. You know, I don't want to keep track of how many things I have frozen or sealed because that's bad for me, right? But one for all, full cowling, 8%, falling roundhouse. God, what a what a name. Um, this is the fun one. And, you know, I put it on here. I like Storm. Storm is a very simple mechanic. It's a very powerful mechanic. And they let me play Storm and Magic Standard right now, and I'm having a blast. So... 
Um, it made me realize that that was a big part of what I've liked about this set. Now, granted, the one on screen, full cowling 8% is a little ham-fisted. Um, I do think that it's more interesting when it's not just your character providing the same thing over and over, but that's a topic for a different day. I, I'm just happy that there are characters that you can create like an engine around. Um, you know, you've got the... The, every time you've you know cleared a card from your card pool you're gonna get speed and damage with this attack we've got characters that are you know wall counter based for every time they sacrifice something or deal damage every time a block is played every time you discard a card you know so they all do have their own uniqueness when I talked about the character design being like a, a little lackluster not super interesting they are still bringing like a unique take to it so that matters a lot again i wanted to end on a positive note so you know that stuff shouldn't be taken too too seriously because the, the again the dopamine rush you get from just saying like okay my deck is built to build these wall counters every time I do this thing, or it's built to every time I sacrifice one, you have to sacrifice one, right? You have to ruin one um, with like the Aaron Yeager attack Titan. Uh, Sasha, every time she clears, she's gonna add a one diff. So like these things, while they might not be the most interesting or they might not be the, uh, the most powerful character designs, um, all throughout this set, there are ways that you can build this thing up right you can build up this this big huge uh you know every time i've gained life counter and you just have massive damage with ymir that's probably the most obvious one i've seen uh the ymir decks that are paying life for bonus effects and then gaining it all back and then they're just sending like uh plus eight damage at you is absolutely insane uh the sasha decks are super interesting to see you know what kind of one diffs that they're always looking for if they're looking to build or you know it's just another card to throw away for bonus damage um but you get to you get to formulate your turn around that right you get to try to see how many times can i clear my card pool how many times can i get a wall counter so there's a lot of non-deterministic turns that come from these uh these characters and, and and a lot of the cards in the set so i'm here for that i i think that the event based gameplay is kind of interesting and i think that the most important part is it gives your deck something to do besides winning the game and if you can't have fun when you're not winning it's probably time to take a break so we gotta find ways to have fun even when we're not winning and for me Sending a 16 speed for 12 damage falling roundhouse, even if it doesn't win me the game, feels pretty good because that means I cleared eight cards from my card pool, and that's more cards than I started with <laughs> at the start of the turn. Anyways, what are your guys' ups and downs? Let me know in the comments below uh, which of these ups were actually a down for you. I'm sure not everyone agrees with me, so let me know in the comments down below.